Hey, J Bone Nation! Shaming of Jay! He's not a dopey dumb bitch! He gets laid! The court jester! The court DJ! It's time to dive into the case! To the case! What's up, everyone? Look who's here. He's in his suit, straight from Core TV. Bob Mata from Defense Diaries. Uh, Bob, what is up, Jabo? Listen to me. I don't know. This is this is the first time you've been on here. Right now, Bob, we are streaming to Facebook, Twitch, Kick, and YouTube. You're about to drop a lot of fucking shit to a lot of people. And Bob, let me tell you, the folks, guys. Damn, son, you worldwide. Everyone throw on the Bob Motto emoji so he can see it across the screen. Just wait for this, Bob. There's Gary. Don't do Gary. He doesn't like Gary. Throw up the Bob Motto emoji so he can see it. So, guys, let me just let me just set this up for there. Do you see it, Bob? You see your face? No. Oh, oh, oh. There look I at am. that guy. Look at Aww. that guy. That guy's so cool. Look at him. Look and at we him. got on um, if you could look there, that's the chat from Kick from YouTube. All everyone's chatting underneath us, but so let me just, and I'll turn off this so it's not distract. But there's Bob on the screen, guys. I so it. I'm stream. I just started my stream this morning. I just started it, and the phone rings from Bob. And I know it's a big deal when the phone rings from Bob's because Bob's usually texting me or messaging me in uh, Twitter DMs. We're talking. We're always going back and forth all the time. But Bob calls me. I know something's going on, and Bob's like, "Dude, this fucking document. This dropped at like two in the morning." He's talking about Odinism. I'm like, what are you talking about, Bob? The only thing I know about Odin is like the great beard of Odin and and, and uh, you know Thor and Odin. But t Bob, tell tell the folks. Fucking Vikings, man. Fucking right. Vikings. Yeah. So I like I get up, I like open my eyes to get the kids off for school at like I, whatever, man. Like six thirty. Scarlett's got to be out to the bus by like seven o'clock. I get back, and somebody had tagged me. Um, and I want to give the name of the account because uh, it was righteous, man. Um, she she tagged me, and her her Twitter account is the Unraveling. All right, um, and it's uh, hold on, I want to give it. It's the Unraveling. How the fuck do I see? Oh, it's uh, at the un or at the underscore Raveling eight Unraveling. So U N R A V E L I N G eight. I want to give her cred because she got me this document like at the crack because I had Alice and I'm like, call the clerk, the county clerk, call him. We got to get the call. I'm like online, like the cat meme, trying to figure out if I can get the fucking document. Cat Can't meme. get the document. So I'm, I'm eternally grateful that uh, the unraveling got me that document. I start digging in and I'm like, Jay's on. I, I got it. I got to get to Jay. Like, I got to call Jay immediately. We're streaming this shit today. Like, like, and I was super disappointed. I had set up for court TV yesterday. You know, they had called and asked me to jump on, obviously having no idea that this bombshell was going to drop. So like, and, and Jay could hear it in my voice. I'm like, Jay, Jay. He's like, what are we, you know, I'm going like a million miles an hour. I'm like, I'm like panting and like, oh, I can't believe this document. I've never seen anything like so I'm like, just get it ready. I'm going to be on it too. So Jay's like, dude, I got you. We good. They start doing all the magic. We get our graphics up. We got Stevie. We got Shans. We got the whole fam just crushing shit. So here we are. And I'm just going to say this right up front. I am stunned by this document. I, I have been practicing law for a long time. I have had crazy cases. If y'all don't know what the Delphi case is, uh, it, it, like kind of the nutshell is is you had two beautiful young girls back on February 13th of 2017 and it was uh Abigail Williams and Liberty Germain uh they had a day off school that was supposed to be a uh it was a, a scheduled snow day that ended up not getting used so they gave the kids off at school uh they went out to this bridge near Delphi Indiana 
it was an area that that a lot of people like people go to walk it's you know a very popular area for people to go it's not like when you're thinking of a train uh like a like a trestle over train tracks that like over water it's not like it's not like that it's like it's an area where they invite people to come have picnics take walks ride bikes do that kind of stuff so at any rate, the girls are on the, the tracks. They get dropped off by their sister. They're supposed to get picked up by, uh, I believe that it was Libby's dad. And he gets there, no girls, all right? And this is in, you know, like between one and three in the afternoon. Huge manhunt starts, you know, like they, the family knows immediately the girls aren't flaking off like this. It's not their style. They can't get a hold of them on the phones. They become extremely concerned immediately uh so they they call in around five o'clock like 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 most parents they call friends first right they're, they're not like going from zero to calling the police instantaneously they're saying all right let's call all their friends let's let's root around and see if we can find them so we could be super pissed at them and they're gonna be punished blah 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 that doesn't happen they can't find them at around 5, 5.15, they go to law enforcement and are like, our girls are missing. We don't know where they're at. So law enforcement, and, and again, we're in February, so it's getting dark early. All right. So the search on the on the night that the girls go missing is very, very short. Okay. And at that point, they get kind of like a, a, a bolo out there, be on the lookout for the girls. It gets broadcast on the news stations that the girls are missing. The town, it's all all hands on deck, man. Delphi, Indiana. And if you all follow me on Twitter or in real life or whatever on, on the streams, I'm, I'm boots on the ground with this case. I am in Delphi for every one of the hearings. I'm in that courtroom. I've been following this case since the minute it took place. And, you know, I, I have a vested interest in terms of wanting justice for the girls and justice for their families. So when they finally make an arrest five years later, so the case goes cold. All right. They, they go out. They discover the girls the following morning down by a river that's off uh, the bridge. OK, so probably, you know, walking distance. Three days later, I think it's the 15th is when they first drop this video. It turns out that uh, there was a video taken on uh, on liberty's snapchat okay so she she was smart enough brave enough to get some video it's a it's the famous video of bridge guy all right so it's got it like it's, it's very short there's no sound when they originally drop it it is uh essentially just like about a th two to three second clip blown up it's grainy and you see this guy just kind of like lumbering across the tracks okay and I think it's the following day that they released this sound where this, this guy, theoretically, it's the same. Because the one thing that I've never known about it is do we know definitively that that sound came from that particular video? Or is it two different videos and they're taking the sound from one, they're showing us the video of bridge guy and they're they're creating them as it's one and they very well may may be that could absolutely be the sound i'm just saying until trial until we see if there's going to be a trial based on this fi on this filing um but you know in, in the the sound in it is is a guy saying girls down the hill so it's that ominous it's probably the most famous like true crime like little short video that's ever been in existence it's like you know the it, it's just it's it's incredibly eerie in terms of what we know happened to the girls so they end up finding the girls the crime scene photos have never been released there's been some leaks of some some of the crime scene photos uh that has been controversial that people were leaking those um so fast forward five years, you know, like the, the whole town knows about the case and then it becomes a worldwide case. And it really is one of those cases that, that you had the video and this down the hill sound that created this just like people in their minds were like fascinated by this case. So fast forward five years, case goes cold. All right. And then October of last year, like just 
the whole world explodes when there's finally an arrest on, on this case. And it's this guy, Richard Allen. And, you know, so I, of course, start digging into that. I read the, you know, cause we had two PCAs, two probable cause affidavits that dropped in, in relatively quick succession. First we had Delphi and I'm digging through this, this PCA and I'm like, man, it's thin. Like, I, I don't know, like, where's the connection here other than the fact that, this guy made a statement on either the day that the girls went missing to a, a resource officer or the day after where he said, yeah, I was out there. You know, I, I was out there and I walked and I was looking on my phone and I stopped to check out the fish. I was looking at the stock ticker and he worked, you know, he worked at Walgreens. And one thing I'm not clear on is if he was doing to work that night or if it was the following night because he, he worked. Uh, behind the counter at Walgreens. At that point, uh, the the report that he made, and I just want everybody to say, when I said it was all hands on deck, anybody that had a badge, they had out and they had made a statement. Look, if you were out at the bridge on that day, please, please help us. We need to try to narrow down. We want to know everybody that was out there that day. Either you could have witnessed something and we just want to know if you were out there so that we can have an understanding of how many people were out there the day that the girls went missing and ultimately were killed. And so Alan went out and made a statement to a resource officer that was outside of a grocery market. You, you know, and I, I think that the, my understanding is that the person was stationed there. There wasn't just like, hey, are you a cop? I want to give the state like the person was there to take statements. That thing gets buried for five years. And like their fingers are pointed by law enforcement. They end up trying to say that it was a civilian employee of the feds that buried it in a file and it didn't get unearthed for five years. And at that point, they create this affidavit. And in the affidavit, they basically have four to five witnesses that say that they, you know, a few girls that saw a guy on the bridge, a woman that saw uh, somebody walking away from the bridge and it's the muddy and bloody clothes witness. And, you know, they, they go in and they ask for an arrest warrant based on that affidavit. So, you know, I, I've, I've picked that thing apart. I've always thought it was super weak. And like I was saying, and then we get a few months later, the Idaho four PCA drop. So like in my history of lawyering, I've never seen the public ever digging in to probable cause affidavits like I had with those two cases. It's like, it changed everything. It's like with our online community and all the people that have interest in true crime and all the sleuths out there and all the people that just want to try to help and solve cases and they want to dig in and we've got the resources right at our fingertips with the internet. You know, people start digging into those things and it's like, I, I've been reading those for 20 years. You, you know, I, I like, I was having arguments with everybody. They're like, oh, they didn't put the strongest evidence in the PCAs because that's a I'm like, no, it's not, that's not what happens. They do put the strongest evidence that they have at the time. Those are going to get attacked. Like you don't withhold strong evidence out of a PCA because you're going to what? Like play gotcha with the defense? It makes no sense. You don't do that. The defense is getting all the discovery no matter what. So I thought that that was paper thin. And so, but it was enough to get him arrested. He's taken into custody and I'm talking about Richard Allen. And so they have a couple of hearings. And so I'm down there uh, at the last hearing, which I want to say was in July, June or July. I can't remember at this point, whatever the last hearing date is. And that's when this bombshell comes out that Richard Allen was on a jail uh, recording phone call with his wife and that he's made admissions to killing the girls. So like I'm sitting there in the courtroom, I look at this guy shuffle in, he's lost, I don't know, 80 to a hundred pounds. He's gaunt. He's got a, he's got that thousand yard stare, just distant, vacant, nothing. I'm with my buddy Kurt. I'm like, man, this guy is like, he's either highly medicated or he's just absent mentally or a combination of both. You could just see it. Like there, there's no faking the way he looked. So at any rate, we were supposed to be there for what I was hoping was going to be a bombshell hearing on uh, on a couple of different things. It was a it was a, a bail application. They were trying to get him bail 
because the defense had said, look, they don't have any evidence against this guy. Like, like I, I know they wanted to get an arrest, but they're, they don't have any evidence. They have to have evidence and they're making a lot of bald assertions in this probable cause affidavit. So I went in there because this case has been sealed. Like up until that date, this like it has been zero information. It was like sealed as sealed can be. It was sealed like Idaho 4. There was nothing, nothing was leaking out. Like aside from those few crime scene photos. And it's been a, a case with massive speculation. You got the, the Keegan Klein, you know, the, the kitty porn guy who just pled out to like 50 counts of kitty porn that, you, you know, that, that he had drawn the girls. There were all kinds of theories going on out there, except the one that we found out of, about today. Two in the I, morning, right? Two in the yeah, morning? Yeah, two in the morning it got filed. And it's, it's 136 pages. And what it is, and, and I had intimated it. Uh, when I read the motion, because they filed a motion to suppress on Friday. Okay, so they, they filed a motion to pre uh, suppress the search at Richard Allen's house that took place post arrest. And they're saying that they want everything from that suppressed because of its fruit of the poisonous tree that they went in. And I'm reading through that. And one of the paragraphs talks about how they were able to get the warrant by lying to the judge about things. Okay. And, and that's what brings us. So at that time, if you look at my tweets, I'm like, even though they don't mention a Frank's hearing, this is Frank's hearing language. Like, so I'm not a prophet. I'm just a really good lawyer. <laughs> so at that point I'm like, all right, this is Frank's Frank's hearing language, man. They're, they're asking for a Frank's hearing without asking for it. So little I know that they were, clearly working their asses off over the weekend to get this 136 page memorandum done and digging through evidence. And like this, this is like, this is real life lawyering shit. This is like the shit. Like I doubt that these guys slept one minute over the weekend and they had all their staff working on this. Everybody's digging the evidence. They're trying to put this thing together. So it's cogent. So 2 AM, they file it with the clerk because everything's filed online these days. It hits. So it's first the, the the motion for the Franks hearing. Bring it up, Jay. Yeah. Well, before I bring it up, folks, I'm going to put it in here. Make sure, uh, as we always say, that you are checking out. This is Bob Mata from Defense. I know you guys all know, but Bob Mata, Defense Diaries. I added to my little prompt here, Bob's YouTube. If you are not subscribed to his YouTube, subscribe because He's going to be putting some stuff out. You're going to want to be there. So before, so I just put it in there. Subscribe to the pod. Give it five stars. Check out the YouTube. And let's go to the documents. Let's check it out. All right. All right so we, so this is it. So this is, this is what they call a Frank's hearing. All right. So essentially what, like for lay people, what a Frank's hearing means is that the defense is stating that law enforcement went in front of a judge OK, in order to try to get the judge to sign off on a search warrant and, and like anything, when you're you're reading a probable cause affidavit that is attached to a complaint for warrant. OK, and complaints are for warrants are what you bring to the judge and you say, your honor, we want a search warrant either of a person, of premises, of a vehicle of phones, whatever it may be, whatever they want to search for. And you have to have probable cause in order to get the judge to say, okay, I find that there's sufficient probable cause in order for you to move forward. I'll issue this warrant. Here you go. Go have fun. Go do your search. So what they're suggesting here is that Tony Liggett, who was the sheriff at this time, that when he, when he was the affiant, he was the person who signed the affidavit, okay? And what they're claiming in this is that he lied flat out that he made things up out of whole cloth that he changed statements of witnesses it's it's the kind of thing that as a defense lawyer you are terrified to do because you're casting shade on law enforcement and i can tell you that a majority of judges that sit on the bench in this country are former prosecutors don't trust me on that google it it's just is like there are not many defense guys and gals on the bench. It's like the track is you go to the prosecutor's office and then you, you go to the, the bench. All right. So anytime a defense attorney is going to cast massive 
massive shade. And this, believe me when I tell you this, I've never seen shade like this casted with receipts. I've seen it done plenty of times on speculation. When I, when I, so they're basically saying that Liggett lied and that, that he got a warrant that he shouldn't have gotten because without his lies, they didn't have the probable cause because they have no evidence against Richard Allen at the time that they went in to get this, to get the, the warrant for his house. So I'm like, wow, all right, where's the meat? So then after we, so do you guys understand the Frank's hearing? Frank's hearing, you go in and you say, Your Honor, we need a hearing. We need an evidentiary hearing. We want to put on witnesses. We want Your Honor to hear what we've been able to uncover so that we can prove to you, Judge, that the cops lied, that Liggett lied. Because the judge needs to see that in order for them to prevail on a Frank's hearing and to attack the, the four corners of the warrant, they have to prove that Liggett lied. It can't just be bald assertions. It can't be like, it's a gut feeling. He's slippery. You know, it can't be that. They have to have receipts. They got to come with receipts. Hence the 136 page memorandum of law, which is like when I'm reading it, that's when my phone call to Jay takes place. Uh, I'm so let me out my eyes are like, and, and let, let me pour it up, Jay, because like when you first start reading it, let it seems just... insane. It seems like it's a movie plot. It seems like it's some shit that you'd see like in an M. Night Shyamalan movie. It's like you've got like, I, I've never even heard of Odinism, Jay. I never heard of it. Do you understand what I'm saying? To yeah, you? Like, I've never heard. And let me just say, I think what since we're on like Twitch now and like, kick i would say that the motion was because the person that filed the motion was sus bob i think they were sus in filing their motion to get the uh to get the warrant and to do right i mean so basically yeah, don't, don't and, sus yeah. sus they're sus they're suspect so i'm teaching you bob i have to teach you that one things. i actually know because i play what was that game that it was real popular with the like the little dudes with the, like the mask and everybody was playing it and you had to play <laughs> You know, oh, everyone knows what it is. Uh, everyone, so that's where sus came up because like my kids kept calling me sus all the time. I'm like, what the fuck are you talking about? Who are you calling sus? So yeah, I knew I actually knew what that meant, Jay, but I do appreciate you giving me the love. So, right, so yeah, it was they, they definitely said it was sus. And they the and place. like and like you said, there ain't no way that a defense attorney is gonna bring this in front of a judge unless they have 136 pages of shit that they think is like big time, right? I mean, it if did. they right. Well, because that's what I'm saying, because like my whole point of talking about how like you have this track of prosecutors ending up on the, the bench and, and understand something. OK, prosecutors work hand in hand with law enforcement. Law enforcement are their boots on the ground. If a prosecutor says I need more evidence, he is calling whatever department. And, and remember, a prosecutor is for a county. And within a county, you'll have, have you know, multiple cities, some depending on the size of the county, some will have their own police department, some won't, some will have county sheriffs, whatever the case may be, they all work at the behest of the prosecutor's office. They are their resource. They are their boots on the ground. They are the ones that go out and do the investigating. Like they have massive resources. So when you look at the line from law enforcement to the prosecutor, to the judge, when I'm going in, knowing what those relationships are, not necessarily with judges, I like, I'm in no way, shape or form saying judges that are former prosecutors give preference to prosecutors. I would hope that they wouldn't. I mean, because they're human beings, because, you know, because they came from that side of the, the bar, maybe they do subconsciously. I don't know. Like if it's close on a motion to suppress, do they lean towards the prosecution? Maybe. Maybe, probably, but you know, but as far as what we're talking about with a defense attorney coming in and casting shade on a cop, you get the warning, you know, you get the warning from the judge. You better be coming with receipts, dude. Cause if, if you're coming with some bullshit, I'm reporting you to the bar. Like they do not take kindly to defense attorneys just coming in and throwing bullshit up against the wall, especially that is casting shade on law enforcement, saying that they're planting evidence or that they're burying evidence or whatever the case may be. Any shade that you cast on law enforcement, you better come with receipts. So that's what this thing is. This thing is 136 pages of receipts and it reads like a novel. 
I mean, I did a, I did a, a Twitter, which you all should follow on, on my, my Twitter is off the hook. Defense underscore diaries on Twitter, guys. Yeah, I, like I read, I read for about 45 minutes directly from this thing. That's all I did. I didn't talk. I just read this thing because I wanted to read it and I wanted the people to hear it. And I didn't know if people had access to the document yet. I didn't know if people had the ability to be able to read because they're at work and maybe they got earbuds in. I wanted people to start hearing this because it blew my mind. I've never read anything like it. I've never, like, the, the thought of it is is crazy. So they start off with this eight things to know, like this introduction, which is that 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 first thing that you see. And it starts off talking about <laughs> Odinism, like this pagan Viking religion. Like, and I, I love the show Vikings. It was on, I want to say the History Channel was a, a series. It was great. You know, I thought like Odin, I knew that Odin was their God, right? You know, but I never knew that it was like practiced here in North America. I didn't know it was a thing, man. And I didn't know what it was all about. So they go on to say that back early in the investigation, that what had happened is that law enforcement went and talked to some professor. They claim they did at Purdue University, which they talk about here. And they say, Oddly enough, this professor says, no, like, you know, theoretically, they're telling him what they see or they're showing pictures of the crime scene and some of the, the strange things that were found at the crime scene. And, and this professor says, no, that has nothing to do with Odinism. That is that is not related to any kind of cult that I'm aware of. So the defense tries to hunt down this professor from Purdue. And they started asking the cops, they're like, so who's this professor? You didn't like name him. I'm like, oh, I don't know. This guy, this guy was like this big, had glasses, seemed real smart. They can't find this guy. So they're talking to people, you know, in the administration at Purdue. They're like, who, who would have taught this type of class? Who would have been considered an expert in this area? They're like, we don't have a guy like that. There doesn't exist a guy like that. So they, they basically go through and they establish that professor's a ghost and law no one in law enforcement can give you any idea who it is and the reason it matters is because they thought enough of what they found at the crime scene to go find an expert on this type of religious cult type activity in in symbols in runes and things that are you know typically when you think of ritualistic stuff you think of like voodoo you know, and all the different things that come along with that, you know, roosters getting their, their heads cut off and blood and, you know, all the different things that come with all the different religious cults that exist in the world. And so when they, they figure out that like this guy doesn't exist, then they start digging into the discovery that they just got dropped. Okay. And this is when it starts to get incredible. Well, but by the way, Bob, before like, like not to make like, so, uh, so they, this is their first indication that this affidavit, this what was per, was sent out by the sheriff, but but was just a complete bullshit. So they might like complete. They cannot find like you would think if there was something that they used for an affidavit, it'd be like this is Professor so and so. These are his credentials, and they're looking and and they go there and they're like, nope, we have no fucking clue what you're talking about. They, they, like, so they didn't even do that. They they like for in terms of going, they they completely skipped all of this part of the investigation. What they end up doing is shutting down this angle like the odinism thing based on some fictional professor that's insane just it's to insane. start with like, the, dude the, the, like the whole thing is like unbelievable so i i think i think if we read through kind of the first fair like and if you were on my twitter my my spaces i'm sorry but like we have to read through this it kind of breaks down like under the eight things to know it says very early on those in charge of the Delphi murder investigation claim that they consulted with the professor. Okay. And this is the professor stuff after the Purdue professor proclaimed according to state trooper. So you got a state trooper, this guy, Jerry Holman saying that quote, it was not Odinism or any type of cult worshiping or any type of group that would have conducted the crime. So they, they've got a, a fictitious person according to this Indiana state trooper saying this. And at that point, uh, the Odinism angle is completely abandoned by law enforcement. They don't look into it any further. All right. However, fast forward 
Okay, so again, this is this is back in the day. All right, this is this is back when they were starting the investigation. So now, fast forward to September seventh, twenty twenty three. Okay, and you've got so we're we're in twenty seventeen, right? Now now we're in twenty twenty three. So September seventh of twenty twenty three, the leaders of the Delphi investigation team one claim that they can't identify who the professor was and that they have provided no reports from this purport, uh, purported professor, and three, that they've further indicated that they may never be able to figure out who the professor is. Based in large part upon this mystery, per, Purdue professor's opinion, the Delphi investigation leadership claimed that it essentially abandoned considering Odinite involvement in the murders. And then the years passed, 2018, 2019, 2020, 21, 22. That's the five years from the date that the girls died where it went cold. Okay. Thankfully, during those passing years, law enforcement officers, this is where the receipts come in. This is like, I'm reading this in the first paragraph. I'm like, oh shit. They got cops coming with receipts. So thankfully, during those passing years, law enforcement officers, Kevin Murphy, Greg Ferency, and Todd Click continued to pursue the truth. Because of their curiosity and investigative efforts, the inv evidence establishing the names of the likely murder, like they're not just coming saying that cops lied and Liggett lied to get the warrant. They've done the work and they're coming in with alternate suspects, prime suspects. So, they say that they come with the names of the likely murdering members of this Odinite cult became known to the Delphi investigative leadership no later than February of 2018. So they're saying that these three cops start going to the, you know, the, the, the crew, the task force that they formed, the investigative task force. And they say, Hey man, we've dug up some like shit that you're going to want to look into. It's got that smell of West Memphis three, which they were casting that shade on like Damien Eccles, like who was the one, if you guys know, I'm sure as many true crimes fans know Damien Eccles and his two buddies, Jason Baldwin, and I forget what the other kid's name is, but they were accused of murdering these two boys because they were like cult guys. Like Damien always wore black shirts and painted his fingernails black. And, you know, he was super emo and like, oh, that guy's, you know, so it's got that vibe, except it's got the opposite effect because they're rejecting it because of the fact that they're trying to say it was a cult killing. So Indiana's like, nah, we're not doing that unless it's something more nefarious, unless there's allegations that we have law enforcement and correction officers that are Odinites themselves, which we get to. Like, dude, this thing is mine. Well, can I ask you this, Bob? What's kind of blowing my mind is this thing about State Trooper Jerry Holman. So basically, the prosecutor was like, I talked to this dude, and he, like, he doesn't have to give him a recording. He doesn't have to give him anything signed. He could just pr make his affidavit say, Yeah, I talked to Jerry. Jerry's like, yeah, I, I went to the college. No big deal. Essentially, that's right. Like, this is what this affidavit is like, right? Like, he doesn't have to have any proof that he that he talked to, to anyone and he could just make an affidavit. Like, that just blows my mind. Like, but, like, remember, they didn't make an affidavit regarding any of the Odinism shit. Like, like, that is what essentially stopped them investigating this angle. It tunnel visioned them and it excluded anything that these three cops that continued to investigate it. Cause what happened is you've got these guys, Kevin Murphy, Greg Ferency, and Todd click, who are all cops saying, all right, like these fucking guys are going to quit like looking at this, but you know what? We're not, we're going to keep investigating it. And they did. And then when they start finding shit, they start going to the task force, the investigative task force, the Delphi investigation team and saying, look, this is what we got. Like, why aren't you guys looking at this? Let's keep reading. Cause like this, this eight points breaks it down. Like it's unbelievable. All right. So uh, they say that uh, the cult member became known to the Delphi investigative leadership no longer or no later than February of 2018. Okay. So that's when these guys went to them and said, Hey, we've got stuff due to either the incompetence or concerted, uh, concerted intentionality 
those in charge of the investigation refused to arrest or even properly investigate these obvious suspects. So on, on paragraph three, on May 1st of 2023, the state of Indiana, by way of prosecutor Nick McClelland, or McClelland, I'm not sure which way, I always forget. It's one of the two. Received a letter from former Rushville Assistant Police Chief Todd Click. Okay, so Todd Click is now, in 2023, the Assistant Police Chief of Rushville. And Todd Click is one of the three guys that kept investigating the Ode Night angle. All right, so... So the prosecutor of the case, the, pro, the current prosecutor of the case, gets this letter from Todd Click, who is now retired. And as stated in the previous paragraph, Click, Murphy, and Ferency were three of the law enforcement officers who worked on the Delphi murder case, particularly focused on the Odenite angle as it intersected with suspects in Rushville, Indiana. After reading Richard Allen's probable cause affidavit, Click became concerned that the information contained in Richard Allen's affidavit pointing the finger at Richard Allen was underlined far less compelling than the totality of the information that Detective Ferency, Murphy, and Click had accumulated during the Rushville portion of the investigation. The information that Murphy, Ferency, and Click had gathered during their investigation connected men who practiced Odinism in or near Delphi with another group of men who lived in Rushville and then connected both groups of men to the murders. Click was concerned that for some reason, the leadership of the investigative team had failed to share with Prosecutor McClellan the evidence gathered by Click, Ferency, and Murphy. Click's concerns led him to seek out a lawyer. So Click went and hired a lawyer because he's like, hey, man, I'm trying to tell this fool something and he ain't hearing it. And I'm concerned that I'm going to be the one that's going to be thrown under the bus. I want it known what we found and that we went to these guys, not only these guys, but the lead prosecutor. So Click's concerns lead him to seek out a lawyer to assist him in the drafting of a letter. This letter was then sent to none other than Nick McClelland or McClelland. Bob. Yeah. Okay. I was just Go. going to say, I'm no lawyer, but this, I'm just, this sentence is blowing in my mind due to either incompetence or a concerted intentionality, man, that, that don't sound so good, man. I don't know that like, I'm no lawyer, but you don't have to be a lawyer to know that one, Jay, that, <laughs> shit, don't, that shit don't look good, yeah. especially in writing. Okay. So, so now we've gotten to the point McClelland or McClelland gets the letter. Okay, this letter was not provided to the defense. So Click sends the letter to the state, the prosecutor. McClelland doesn't give it to the defense until after it was obvious from the last round of depositions. Now, in Indiana, in criminal cases, they can depose witnesses. We cannot do that in Illinois unless we know that somebody's going to die or the witness is going to be somehow unavailable and, and we 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 can go into the court and, or in death penalty cases we can we can sometimes depose people but as a general proposition we cannot in indiana they can okay so in a deposition if you all don't know is it's a sworn statement under oath and you're you're in there grilling people you're, you're like it gives the opportunity for the defense attorneys to to go in and question witnesses under oath cops under oath to try to get information that it's a, it's a great investigative tool. I don't know why it's not allowed everywhere. It should be because I don't know why defense attorneys have to go in blind, just going off police reports and whatever videos they give us, like having the opportunity to be able to vet these people before trial. Cause like sometimes when you get those cases where you're watching Jay and you're like, like you get the, the defense attorney asking the, the, you know, breaking the golden rule, which is asking the question that they should never ask, which is the one that they don't know the answer to meaning that they don't know what the witness is going to say. You never ask that question because that's how you get your ass handed to you. So like depositions take that out of the mix because you've already asked the question under oath. And if they lie on the stand, you can then impeach them, right? So they're a very valuable tool. All right, so uh, this letter was not provided to the defense until after it was obvious from the last round of depositions that the defense who had doggedly pursued witnesses as far away as Georgia would certainly be talking with Todd Click. McClelland had this letter in his possession for over four months before turning it over to the defense. 
This There can be no mistaking that this letter is exculpatory in nature. You guys know what exculpatory means, right? That means that it tends to show that Richard Allison is out. Uh, he's out. He's not the guy. Okay. And uh, that is exculpatory in nature and could have been used by the defense as it prepared for as it prepared for upcoming depositions. However, it is apparent that McClellan only offered up the letter after it was obvious that the defense team would soon be learning of the letter's existence. In other words, the defense team would obviously be meeting with or deposing Click in the next few weeks. At that time, Click would most certainly then reveal to the defense in that April 23rd that he, Click, had sent a letter containing exculpatory information to McClelland. At that point, McClelland had two distinct choices. One, to sit on the exculpatory evidence, hoping the defense team would refocus its efforts on another angle of the investigation, or to disclose the exculpatory evidence, claiming that he, the contents of the letter were overlooked in the huge volume of discovery. Oh, it was buried. Yeah, I had it. I just forgot about that type of thing. All right. So these are these are damning allegations, man. Dude, this is I, I you I, I you know I was streaming, so I had another chance to look at this. You reading this and looking at this, this is insanity. Uh, and, and this is this is nothing. Like, dude, it get, like this it gets crazier and crazier as you go on. So so McClellan chose the latter. He chose to say, Oh yeah, I got this letter, it was buried. Unfortunately for the state. Neither approach explains away that fa the fact that Click specifically directed the letter to McClellan himself. And further, that Click was so determined to ensure his information was consumed by McClellan that he directed the information directly to McClellan via certified mail. The letter is stamped received May 1, 2023, Carroll County Prosecutor. Click's report landed at ground zero, a prosecutor's office with no more than two full-time prosecutors and a handful of full-time staff members at best. Could this exculpatory evidence have been completely overlooked? Not plausible. That's what that's what that's what Rozzi says. That's that's Allen's lawyer. Not only did the prosecution withhold that letter from the defense, but the law enforcement, but law enforcement also withheld several other exculpatory pieces of evidence, including an 85-page document or compilation of reports by Click prepared in 2019 and several videos containing statements that support the defense theory of Richard Allen's innocence, actual innocence. This 85-page report detailed the investigative work performed by Click, Ferency, Murphy, and others, including the FBI. According to the summary of Click's investigation that he attached with his letter, the Behavioral An uh, Analysis Unit, the BAU, of the FBI determined that the individual's response, this is the feds, okay? This is what their determination was. We should get Mac on here, see what she has to say. She'll be like, oh, hell, they ignored the feds? Fuck damn. <laughs> you know, so uh, right. so uh, the FBI determined that the individual or individuals responsible for the homicides were involved in Nordic beliefs. That's what the feds said. Underline black... This was news to the defense, as no member of the Unified Command, which is the task force, uh, in charge of the investigation, revealed this information to the defense during the recent deposition. So during all these depths, no one said anything about it. So they're deposing all these cops about their investigation. No one, no one says peep. Silence. Okay, this includes Trooper Holman, who told the defense that he didn't remember if the FBI's BAU uh, unit determined one way or another whether or not those with Nordic beliefs had been involved in the murders. All Bro, right? what is with this Trooper Holman, man? I do. I don't. Is he an Odinite? Oh, oh, maybe. <laughs> uh, all right. So, at least up until this time of the filing, the prosecuted uh, the prosecution had provided no evidence whatsoever of the findings of the FBI's BAU unit concerning involvement in Odin, of Odinists in the murders. None. The letter that Click sent to McClellan was the first that the defense had heard that the FBI actually believed that Odinists were likely involved. In other words, the, re the report contained exculpatory evidence that Unified Command concealed from the defense. This information was and is crucial for Richard Allen's defense. Some of this exculpatory evidence in the form of videos was finally released to the defense on September 8th, 2023, over nine months after defense counsel entered their appearance. The defense is still reviewing the September 8th evidence dump 
in the brief time the defense uh, has had time to review this newly discovered evidence or newly received evidence, it has found exculpatory evidence in both in videos the defense has watched and the documents that the defense has received and reviewed. While the prosecution has been holding onto this exculpatory evidence, Richard Allen has been living in hell. Okay. Dude, holy shit. Dude, 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 it's unbelievable. All right. So, like, like I don't want to take four hours. Like, I would literally sit here and read this to everyone for four hours. That's how fucking psychotic I am. So let's <laughs> let's just try to go through like some of the so I mean <laughs> dude, uh, it, like so they, they they start like naming names. Like I, I want to just pick out the stuff that just like blows my mind. So I mean, wh while you're looking, um, when when they have this hearing, I mean, is the judge going to be like, "What the fuck is happening here, guys? Like this is done." Like when all because this and they have the receipts. What else can the judge say when they have this hearing? I like he's going to have to fucking like suppress everything from the search of his house like like they filed another motion they're like get him out of westville correctional facility right the fuck now and, and we'll get to that why because it, dude the story just gets more insane like so it's it's one thing to have like cops like sweeping shit under the rug and being like hey you know that odinous shit sounds crazy like well now we're gonna go and there's like a bunch of vikings running around fucking killing girls sounds crazy you know because it sounds crazy on its face like I hit, up, does. I, I hit Brett Talley, like, you know, the prosecutor's my buddy. I'm like, hey, man. He's like, oh, oh yeah, Vikings are murdering people. I'm like, come on, dude. I'm like, did you read the thing? So wanting to allay his fears that an innocent man was sitting in Westville, Click, we're still talking about the cop, Click, whose affidavit is attached to this, okay, agreed to attend the meeting with Holman, hoping that he would be learning. So I, I kind of skipped the part. Like you had a couple of guys hit up click. So McClelland and Holman request a meeting with click in August of, of 2023. They're like, Hey, Hey man, uh, listen, yeah, we kind of been looking through some stuff. We want to kind of sit down with you. So this is like, like after the arrest of Allen, you know, like we're, we just, you know, we just want to have a sit down and just kind of clear the air here. You know, we want to give you some receipts on, on what we have on Alan. All right. Like, we want to make you feel better about this because we can we can sense we can sense that you're you're a little bit upset that, that, that you're you're not all on board with the Alan thing. So we want to we want to have you come in and and we want to fill you in. OK, so that's what happened. So this is coming directly from Click's affidavit regarding that meeting. Uh, it says upon directing the letter to Mr. Uh, McClellan. I heard nothing from the prosecutor's office or any other members of the unified command until I received a phone call on August 23rd and August 25th of 2023, which involved brief discussions regarding scheduling. During these phone calls, it was requested that I meet with Trooper Holman, our buddy, during the week of September 4th of 2023. I was informed that law enforcement officials intended to sit down with me and discuss with me the reason why Richard Allen was responsible for these crimes. So he's like, all right, they got some shit. I'm starting to feel a little better. I can sleep at night now. Now, now maybe it wasn't the Vikings that killed them. All right. So at this point, he was told that Jerry Holman wanted to put his mind at ease. However, during the meeting with Detective Holman and a second detective whose name I am unfamiliar with, there was no discussion or offerings as to why they believe that Richard Allen was guilty of the charge crimes. This is in bold. You can see it right there. I believe the interview was an attempt by them to clean up their loose ends, knowing that they had given very little, if any, attention to the investigative efforts of myself, Detective Ferretzi, and Detective Murphy. All right, so that lays the groundwork for it right there. Okay. Uh, they then start to kind of lay it out. The next thing in four, they're talking about, we are going to, like, so there is a body of this memorandum that goes on for 100 pages. This intro goes on for 20 pages where they kind of break it down. They're like, this is what we're telling you. And then in the body of the memorandum, we're going to give you all the receipts. So we're, we're going to brief it here for you in case you don't feel like reading 136 pages right now, but we want you to get the flavor 
of what we're bringing to you. And then when you're ready, read the memorandum because that's where we've got all the receipts for you. Bob, is one of is is one of the exhibits a Google map of uh, Holman's house, which is actually a replica Viking ship? Is that true that there? The man, I mean, this guy, how, like, what the fuck? Dude, like, well, you messaged me when I was on uh, Court TV, and you're like, dude, this fucking guy's still on his face. He's like, active right now on his Facebook. And I'm like, oh, I'm like, it's Bob right, doing dude. a Jay I'm impression. Like, I'm, I'm fucking texting, like, sleuthy. I'm like, God damn it, I need you. Where are you? I need you digging. Dig, dig, woman. <laughs> no one did, like, sleuthy. So, um, so, all right, so at that point, uh, they talk about Liggett. So Tony Liggett was the Carroll County Sheriff. Okay. He's the guy that goes in and gets the affidavit. He's the guy that you're talking about. Remember, Jay, I want you to be clear. He's not going in there making up shit where he's saying, Oh, uh, we're discounting the, he does. They don't even bring up Odinism. Okay. That has nothing to do with that affidavit. That affidavit only has to do with, they got a statement from Richard Allen where he puts himself on the bridge on the afternoon. The girls went missing They've got an affidavit that he claims that he's wearing the same clothes that it appears that the bridge guy was wearing in the video. And then they've got these five other independent witnesses that are all saying various things that they saw a guy on the bridge and he kind of looks like what Richard Allen looks like. And he's wearing the same shit that Richard Allen said. So that was their case. That was what they went in for to get the arrest warrant on the PCA. No mention of Odinism at all. Okay. Not, not mentioned. So what they go on to say is that Liggett went ahead and he concealed so these are the these are the allegations against this the sheriff okay so these are big allegations like is a defense attorney you're staring at you getting disbarred if you're gonna sit there with come with some bullshit or you're gonna say that a cops like the sheriff is walking into a judge and just bald face fucking lying like you're you're saying that that rosie brad rosie and Baldwin don't give a shit about their law licenses, that they're just going to walk in with some whole cloth thing and make some shit up. And I'm here to tell you that is not what's happening here. Like people are like, is this just defense lawyering? I'm like, it's 136. Defense lawyering is a two page motion with some bullshit. 136 pages of anything is receipts. That's what it is. So Bobby. what they're claiming is that because Liggett, also concealed damaging witness statements that devastate Liggett's timeline. So a timeline Liggett needed to be true in order to place Richard Allen at the trail when Abby and Libby were abducted. Additionally, Liggett lied in his affidavit about the statements of another key witness, further devastating Liggett's timeline. That's paragraph. So they throw Liggett completely under the bus. There's your, that, that is the shit that is the Frank's hearing shit. They're, they're going to, they're going to provide, they're going to put on these witnesses that, that he included in the affidavit and they're going to testify that he changed what they said, like flat out. Like they're, they're like, it, dude, I am going to like, if I have to camp out for a week to get into that courtroom, there's no fucking way I'm not in that courtroom for this Bob. thing. Man. Zero percent chance. Why am I picturing uh, the end of Shawshank Redemption where Liggett's looking out his window and every, you know, like that's just what this is reading like, like this massive, Dude. massive thing that's coming out that no one knew about that had been going on. And now everyone knows about it. Like that's I'm just picturing that in my head right now. Jay, salvation lies within. <laughs> Remember the nice little, little hammer in there? All right. Uh, I digress. <clears throat> All right. So. Paragraph five, and this is like the hits just keep on coming. And this is just a summary, kids. Oh, no. This isn't the meat. Um, what happened? Something amazing? No, you're good. You were, it was a little lag, but you're good. Go ahead. Okay. Well, was it me lagging? I don't. Oh, I think we're good. We're good. Okay. Okay. So uh, paragraph five, Richard Allen has zero connections to any pagan cult or pagan cultists. And furthermore, this like this is the part that matters. Okay. We like this is our taste of what has been going on post Allen arrest. This is when they've gotten his DNA. This is where they've sent it to the lab. This is where they got his phone, his computer, his devices. This is this tells us all we need to know. Richard Allen has zero connections to any pagan cults or pagan cultists. And furthermore, no forensic evidence such as DNA or electronic evidence links Richard Allen to the girls or to the crime scene 
i.e. he is a completely innocent man. Like I, I just want that to resonate with people because if he's been in there for nine months under the conditions that he's been in and all this shit bears itself out, boy, heads are going to roll, bro. Heads are going to roll. And, and like, I'm here for it. I'm going mean, to be, I want to be all up. It's, it's crazy. All right. So did you have something, Jay? I was just going to ask, like with this coming out, shouldn't this hearing be like tomorrow? Like how long do they have to wait for this hearing now? The state's going to get to respond. Like always, there's going to be a state. Man. Response in writing. I mean, obviously, yeah, that's so, it's just. I mean, like I, if I'm, if I'm Nick McClelland, I'm not enjoying writing this response. Like, honestly, like I, I'm trying to like, so I'm going to say, all right, well, yeah, I got the letter. It's exactly like they said. Yeah, I got, it got buried. I mean, it's Vikings. No one thinks that Vikings killed the girl. You know what I mean? It's going to have to be that. It's going to have to be the way Brett Talley was talking about it. Like, it's insane. No, no, we have Vikings. Yeah, there's there's cults out there. I mean, until you start reading the evidence they have, it sounds crazy. So, all right. So there's most of the evidence backing these assertions was found scattered over no less than 10 hard drives and several flash drives. And I know we've had people talking about how much data is stored on hard drives like we were talking about the 51 terabytes, like, like sleuth, you'll talk about it. Like sleuth, what'd you come up with? Well, like how much was 51 terabytes? Remember when we were having the, the Idaho four 51 terabytes. How much evidence is that? Not evidence, so, much evidence. so it's, it's a lot. It's 10, 10 hard drives, right? All right. So they're digging, they're digging, they're digging. And then they find, okay. So here's where it gets, it, dude, it just keeps getting crazier. Not coincidentally, Members, Odinists of the same pagan cult are employed as correction officers for the Indiana Department oh of Correction at Westville Correctional Facility, which is where Richard Allen is housed. It is inside of the cold concrete walls of the maximum security unit of this dilapidated reformatory that Richard Allen is being threatened, intimidated, and mentally abused. Throughout this document, References are made to the Unified Command. Essentially, the Unified Command was the leadership of the Delphi murder investigation. According to Tony Liggett, the Cairo County Sheriff and member of the Unified Command when he uh, when the investigation began, Unified Command consisted of law enforcement from a variety of entities, uh, local, state, and federal. Unified Command were overseers of the entire investigation operation. According to Liggett, the members are as such. From Cairo County, Tony Liggett, Kevin Hammond from state police, our buddy, Jerry Holman, Jay Harper, and Dave Vito or Vito. And from the feds, a guy named Rich Davies. All right. So then they get into the Odism, Odinism, Odinites and runes, runes, R-U-N-E-S. If you're kind of like a, like a gaming dork, like I am, like if you ever play like, like magic, the gathering or like dungeons and dragons, it's like, you know, it's like, like I'm a gaming nerd like that, you know, like I don't have time for it anymore, but I miss it. So like, I'm not shy to admit it. So runes. So this is how they describe it. Odinism is a pagan religion referenced above and its followers are called Odinites. Odinites are enamored of Viking Nordic culture. I mean, technically I'm probably an Odinite because I think Vikings are cool as fuck. I mean, I just, I think <laughs> cool. um, all right. So evidence supports this, this is big evidence supports that at the crime scene, which we have never, no one has seen any of the substantive pictures. Like I said, there's been a couple of leaks, data leaks, photos have been spread out there. I had somebody messaging me photos, but it was only of various things. Nothing like this evidence supports that at the crime scene, these murdering Odinites left behind obvious signatures, symbols in the form of runes. Okay. And they, Miriam Webster defines a rune as any of the characters of any of self, uh, several alphabets used by the Germanic peoples from about the third to the 13th centuries. Okay. Many runes look like the letter F, uh, including a rune called a news, N, uh, A-N-S-U-Z, which among other things stands for Odin. Okay. And Odin's like the main dude, like God. Okay. So. These runes were formed with sticks, number one, 
fashioned with tree branches, okay, <laughs> and three painted using the blood of Liberty German. All right, like just I want you to let that sink in. All right, like so Liberty's blood was like used to paint these runes. Sticks and branches were deliberately, carefully, and proficiently placed on each girl in a certain arrangement, mimicking certain runes. At least one of the branches appeared to have its end cut off cleanly by some type of tool like an electric saw, providing proof of a preconceived plan. Additionally, the blood of Liberty German was used to paint a mark uh, to, as the paint to mark a tree with a rune that looks similar to the letter F. So they used her blood to paint a tree near where the girls were, were laying. With a simple Google search, these runes would be identifiable as one of the many calling cards of this pagan religious cult. Yet law enforcement in charge of the Delphi investigation seemingly and quickly abandoned the obvious correlation between the crime scene and Odinism, despite, uh, despite an obscene amount of evidence linking Odinism to the crime scene. And even in spite of powerful evidence linking Odinites in and around Indiana to the murders. It's crazy, man. I mean, I just got um, like, I just got like, I just like shivered just like just listening to that. But like, so th they're saying that obviously the like there's pictures of this, right? There's pictures or videos of this because they wouldn't yeah. be saying it if there weren't. And then they're saying that despite having those pictures and videos of this, the police were like, nah, that's no big deal. We don't have to worry about that. That's right. That's exactly what they're saying. All right. So also, as the court will learn in the affidavit for search warrant that Sheriff Liggett failed to inform Judge Diener, who has since recused himself from the case, that nothing, absolutely nothing, links Richard Allen to Odinism or any religious cult. Also, no forensics such as DNA, no electronic data extracted from his computers or his phones or from his social media link Richard Allen to the crime scene. Additionally, nothing links Richard Allen to any of the Odinite suspects. The same Odinite suspects that evidence strongly supports sacrificed Abby and Libby in some sort of pagan ritual. Rich and Allen had nothing to do with this crime, but rather is an innocent man, a patsy for the police, arrested 26 days before. Oh my election. God. 26 days before an election. That's when he was arrested. This is. Yeah, dude, like failure to pursue the Odinist links. Law enforcement, like, like, like like we, we can read this for days, but I, I just want to get through some of the, like just the, the, like the mind blowing shit law enforcement's failure to actively pursue the obvious links between the crime scene and Odinism is confounding. It is even more confounding when days and weeks after the murders, a particular Odinite from Logan's port named Brad Holder, your buddy, your guy that's super active on the Facebook as we speak. You want me to throw him up or you want to keep reading? Throw it up. Let's see what Brad's up to. Guys, let's well you let's 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 talk about Brad first and then we'll throw up his shit. Okay, yeah, let's talk about Brad. Uh, uh so a guy named Brad Holder posted on social media images mimicking the very runes found at the crime scene. A scene unreleased and unknown to the general public even to this day. Who is Brad Holder, you ask? Well, he was an Odinite whose son, Logan, I want you to digest what I'm about to read to you. He was an Odinite whose son, Logan, had been dating Abby. He's dating one of the victims. His son was dating one of the victims. All right. Brad Holder's social media post seemingly taunted the very police that refused to fully investigate him. The defense believes that the court will be shocked at the number of clues or Easter eggs, both before and after the murders that Holder openly posted on his Facebook page that pointed the finger to his involvement in the murders. So here is the picture on uh, Reddit of, this is Logan Holder and Abby Williams right here. Uh, this is the picture. Then here is... Here's Brad's guys. He is still on Facebook as we speak. If if they had the money, I'd sue Brad Rosie for the pain and anguish he has caused me and my family. All you armchair detectives out there, I'm taking. He's taking screenshots, folks. I'm taking screenshots of the comments you post. So keep it up, so uh, I can get some money out of this misery. And then some dude comments. The sad part in almost all of Odinism. 
those kinds of sacrifices that were made that were made were almost actually all volunteers during rituals. So it would almost be out of characteristics for older knights to ritually kill those two Delphi girls, would it not? Sorry you're going through this, Brad. And Brad says, thanks for the support. So these guys are talking about Odinism and how they know about Odinism right now on Facebook as we speak. Like, this is fucking insane. It's insane. I've never seen anything more insane. Here's his like, TikTok, folks, where he... Look at this guy. A veteran Freemason, practice jujitsu boxing, and work out all the time. Who knows what the hell these videos are? There he is. I, <laughs> I don't know. I was scrolling through. And I'll tell you what, dude looks a lot like Bridge Guy. <laughs> here's out. his uh, here's his YouTube, folks, where he sh Brad shaves with music, where Brad is. <laughs> Magnify Jesus. All right, Magnify Jesus. Whoa. I'm not gonna play these songs because I'm gonna get uh, a copyright claim. But this is the guy, folks. And if we go to his photos, I bet you we find a lot of interesting things. So let's he, this guy has not deleted anything, folks, despite being in this in this document. Um, this is just a lot of selfies, folks, a lot of selfies. All right. Uh, but I want you to look at all right, So this is like the bridge guy hat. See, see this one right here, Jay, like the one uh, that the mouse is on right here. Next to, no, next to the baseball picture with behind the fence where he's got the, the hat with the glasses on top. Oh, right here. OK. Yeah. Like that, dude. I mean, like this is like he, it's bridge guy. It's like they're like it, he he looks more like bridge guy. If you look at the two composites that they've done and one they abandon, like when he's got the facial hair. I mean, come on, dude. All right. You keep scrolling. I'm going to keep reading. All right. However, a fact that is simply mind blowing to the defense is that Brad Holder was never considered a suspect in the murders of Abby and Libby. State Trooper Jerry Holman, one of law enforcement officers in charge of organizing and investigating the Delphi murders, claimed in his August 10th, 2023 deposition that Brad Holder was not really ever a suspect. Police reports written near the time of the murders reveal that Jerry Holman is telling the truth. Brad Holder was cleared as a suspect as quickly as an on March 16th, 2017. So a little over a month after the girls were killed. All right. Um, Brad holds it like, so dude, it's just like never ending. Like it's, it's hard for me to pick what to read to you. Cause like, there's nothing that's not insane. All right. So this is, this is where it gets really interesting. Okay. Um, not that all of it hasn't been really interesting. All right, so there's this guy, uh, and his name is so. This brings us to the Georgia thing they were talking about. Um, the investigation had barely begun, but the Unified Command had already cleared the very man that any person with even a small amount of common sense or curiosity would believe is a strong candidate for being in, involved in the murder of the girls. That being Brad Holder, for example, the court will learn that the Unified Command was aware of a very disturbing image on Brad Holder's social media accounts that actually mimicked the crime scene. On April 12th of 2017, a mere two months after the girls were killed, Trooper Joseph Ryan Winters received a, call, a phone call from a man in Georgia named Ryan Boucher, or Boucher, B-O-U-C-H-E-R, who had discovered disturbing images in Brad Holder's social media account. Having somehow learned that Brad Holder's son, Logan, had dated Abby Williams, Mr. Butcher began reviewing Brad Holder's social media history. One of the images that Butcher viewed on Brad Holder's social media account was an image of two dead women, two women either dead or posed if, if, as if they were dead, on the ground in what appeared to be a forest. Both women had tree limbs and sticks attached to their bodies. One of the women had her arms stretched out above her head, similar to the way that Libby's arm was stretched above her head. Both women were clothed and the stick and tree branch formations on these girls was different than the stick and tree branch formations on Abby and Libby, but otherwise it bore a very eerie similarity to the murder scene in Delphi. Ryan Butcher had no knowledge of the actual crime scene. However, after reviewing Brad Holder's social media sites, Butcher was disturbed at the image, as well as other images that provided insight into Brad Holder's fascination with runes. 
believing that the disturbing images may be something of interest to those investigating the Delphi murders, Mr. Butcher contacted Toe Blazenby, who at the time was the sheriff of Carroll County. Blazenby quickly rebuffed Butcher, telling Butcher that Holder was not a suspect. Undeterred, Mr. Butcher contacted the state police, where he ended up talking to Trooper Joseph Ryan Winters. After their conversation, uh, after their conversation, Winters memorialized the interaction, placed the images provided by Butcher into a Dropbox account. After creating the report, Winters then discussed his findings face to face with guess who? Jerry Holman. Hey, Maybe. Bob. Yeah. Check out this post I just found. Uh, a dude hanging from a tree naked. Well, I started back acrylic. Hail Odin, Logansport, Indiana. This guy still has this shit up. He's crazy, dude. He's crazy. He's crazy. All right. So uh, the body in this memorandum will provide in details uh, the interaction between uh, Winters and Bocher. Uh, the defense does not believe the Unified in Command ever followed up on Winters' request. So Winter like asked them. He's like, "Look, this is all the shit that I've compiled from this guy. Why don't you check it out?" They said, "Yeah, we're good." Should be noted the disturbing images found by Butcher in Georgia and placed in a Dropbox by Winter were not and still have not been provided to the defense. In his recent deposition, Winter said that he had attempted to locate the images, but they were unavailable. However, because of the potential importance of those images to Richard Allen's case, the defense team located Butcher, then traveled to Georgia to meet with him. Those images are now in the possession of Richard's defense team, who then provided those images to law enforcement. Again, these were important images that law enforcement failed to turn over to the defense. Instead, the defense located these images in Georgia and then turned them over to the very people who had the obligation to provide them to the defense in the first place. You seen these pictures, Bob? Dude, I mean, that's all, yeah, that's all Odin shit, man. Like, th look at that guy. Holy shit. Better dead than red. Mm. This dude mm -hmm. still has this up. This is, this is. Oh, man. Um, Odin is watching you. Odin is watching you. Wow. Wow. All right. So I'm trying to pick and choose what I want. All right. So here, Unified Command. So we're, we're going to move on from our buddy here. Holder, and we're going to move to the next cat, Elvis Fields, like the terrible Bears quarterback, Josh Fields. Uh, Unified Command was aware that Elvis Fields confessed to his sister that he, Elvis, was involved in the murders, even providing to his sister intimate crime scene details of which only those present at the crime scene would have familiarity. Additionally, Elvis Fields told his sister, Mary, on February 14th, 2017, that he was present at the killings and that he, Elvis, now, quote, had a brother and was now, quote, part of a gang. In February of 2018, Elvis had been questioned by law enforcement. But, but dude, listen to this. Quit scrolling. Listen. Okay. Sorry. Elvis, <laughs> Elvis had been questioned by law enforcement, but denied involvement in the murders. However, so they, they talk to him a year later. They go talk to Elvis. Uh, however, after being dropped off at his trailer following the questions, Elvis turned around, walked back to the police car, and according to the police report, asked the state trooper if, he, if his, Elvis's spit, is found on one of the girls, but he could explain it away, would he still be in trouble? What the fuck? Okay. The state trooper that heard Elvis utter these words, Kevin Murphy, <laughs> Kevin Murphy of the three, was not part of the unified command, but immediately relayed Elvis's disturbing question to Jay Harper of the unified command. Elvis also admitted to a different sister, Joyce, that he, in fact, spit on one of the girls. Elvis told Joyce that he was on a trail and a bridge with two girls that were killed and that he was going away for a long time. Elvis's alibi for February 13, 2017 was also probably flawed. 
State troopers who weren't part of the Unified Command determined that Elvis's roommate concocted a story concerning Elvis's whereabouts on February 13th of 2017. This roommate is named Rod Abrams. Abrams told a story claiming that on February 13th, 2017, that he, Rod Abrams, and Elvis Fields and a man named Ned Smith were visiting a sick friend in Muncie, Indiana. Unfortunately for Rod Adams, this story conflicted with the story that Elvis Fields told law enforcement as to his whereabouts on February 13th. These shady alibis re were relayed to Unified Command. These shady alibis will further be explained in the body of the memorandum. Furthermore, Unified Command knew that on February 1st, 2018, Elvis's sister passed a polygraph examination when asked if she was telling the truth about what Elvis had uh, had confessed to her. Okay, so the sister went and took a poly, hooked up to the lie box. Unified commands to uh, failure to vigorously pursue the pursue the obvious links between the crime scene and Odinism is even more inexplicable when evidence known to law enforcement included information about another Odinite named Patrick Westfall, who was living in Delphi, very close to the murder scene on February 13th, 2017. Okay, so evidence known to Unified Command included facts that fellow Odinites uh, Patrick Westfall and Brad Holder were close friends as late as January 21st, 2017. However, that friendship ended abruptly in February of 2017, the very month and year that the girls were murdered. The schism in their friendship resulted from a fight that occurred between Holder and Westfall in February of 2017, where, quote, he, Holder, and Westfall were in the woods near a river conducting a ritual. One of them said or did something the other did not agree with, and they no longer talked to each other. The river was near Patrick's house, which was right near the murder scene. An intoxicated Brad Holder shared this disturbing information with his ex-wife, Amber Holder. Amber then relayed this disturbing information to law enforcement, who were not a part of the Unified Command in 2019. The officers then relayed this disturbing information to Unified Command. Liggett, Tony Liggett, the sheriff, concealed this information from Judge Diener. So it's not included. Going back to the, the affidavit, okay? Okay, so then they learn in a totally different conversation with uh, his ex-wife, Brad Holder pointed the finger away from himself and directly at Patrick Westfall as being the person actually responsible for the murders of Abby and Libby. According to the police reports, Brad Holder told his ex-wife that Westfall and, quote, his people killed Abigail Williams and Liberty German because one of their mothers was mixing, in quotes, with, uh, with other people outside of the mother's race. There's your motive. Furthermore, Unified Command was aware that Brad Holder had told Amber that, quote, I can only protect you so much if you keep asking questions, end quote. Brad Holder fur, uh, further told his ex-wife Amber that Patrick Westfall had many people backing him uh, and that Westfall also has, quote, powerful friends. Liggett knew of this information for more than three years before Liggett saw, uh, sought a search warrant for Richard Allen's house, yet Liggett never shared information with Judge Diener. Additionally, Westfall provided a very weak alibi as to his whereabouts on February 13, 2017. Westfall told law enforcement that he was at home, the worst alibi in the world, the old I was at the crib alibi, uh, on the afternoon of Monday, February 13, 2017. The defense is unaware of any search warrant that Liggett sought to enter Westfall's house or whether Unified Command instructed law enforcement to knock on a single neighbor's door to verify Westfall's alibi. Ah, Bob. Yeah. Look at the, look at this post I got right here. Uh, Patrick Westfall and myself have been talking bind ruins. What do you guys think? So many possibilities. This is all us still up on this man. Him and Patrick Westfall in 2016. Buffalo. One of the one of the posts was in Delphi. Like this is. I, I'm struggling to. It's mind blowing. It really is. It's absolutely mind blowing. Um, so they talk about another cat named Johnny Messer from Rushville. Johnny Messer was a recruiter for the Odinites. And there was also connective tissue between the Odinites from Delphi area, Brad Holder and Patrick Westfall, and the suspects from Rushville area, Elvis Fields and Rod Abrams. Delphi is located 126 miles from Rushville. Law enforcement knew that Johnny Messer was friends with Brad Holder and Patrick Westfall. Law enforcement also knew that Messer was acquaintances 
with Elvis Fields and Rod Abrams. Unified Command theoretically could claim and actually appears to be claiming that this connection is simply a bizarre coincidence. However, Unified Command not only knew that Elvis Fields and Ron Abrams and Pat, uh, Brad Holder and Patrick Westfall shared a common acquaintance, Johnny Messer, but also that Elvis Fields and Brad Holder follow each other on Facebook and even mimicked each other's Facebook pages with Elvis Fields actually recreating the photos that Holder posted on his own Facebook page. Oh man, it's, it's, it's a lot. It's hard. Um, and additionally, it's infuriating that Johnny Messer was also cleared as a suspect in the murders when considering these facts, that Johnny's ex-girlfriend, Taylor Hornaday, told police that Johnny Messer and Patrick Westfall were like brothers. She also told police that she had allowed Johnny to borrow her car. Dude, this, like, dude, it never stops getting insane. So, so this is Johnny Messer, the recruiter for the Odin Knights. He, he borrowed his, his girl's whip, right? Okay, and... She allowed Johnny to borrow her car on or around Valentine's Day 2017. So the girls were killed on the 13th, okay? So that's right around Valentine's Day. That's, what, a day before, right? Valentine's Day is the 14th, yep. correct? Yep. Every day, every year, every as long year, as it existed. Every year. Okay. And that Johnny drove her car, quote, up there to hang with his Vinlander friends. You guys wondering what Vinlander is? Vinlander is a word, and this is in a footnote, interchangeable with those that practice Odinism. As State Trooper Ro uh, Roland Purdy stated in his deposition, all members of Vinlanders are also Odinists. And that is cited at Purdy Deposition, page 140, lines 1 through 25. Basically, the Vinlanders are a white supremacist group consisting of Odinists. Brad Holder, Patrick Westfall and Johnny Messer were all affiliate, uh, affiliated with the Vinlander group. Johnny Messer's ex-girlfriend, Taylor Hornaday, also confirmed that all Vinlanders are also Odinists and that Johnny Messer, Brad Holder, and Patrick Westfall were all members of Vinlander. Okay, so you got, you got what Vinlanders are? So he's going up to hang out with his Vinlander homies. So when Johnny returns back with her vehicle on and around Valentine's Day, it had dried blood over one side of it. Johnny Messer refused to discuss the details of how the blood got there. Johnny Messer's ex-girlfriend further stated that it took her several car washes to finally remove the blood. Meanwhile, Messer has claimed that he had never, not once in his life, been to Delphi, the home of his, quote, brother, Patrick Westfall, and near the home of his other brother, his Odinite brother his Vinlander brother, Brad Holder. Messer's ex-girlfriend also told law enforcement that Brad Holder and Johnny Messer were two of the most violent people that she knew and were fully capable of having been involved in the murders. Johnny Messer's ex-girlfriend further stated that a motive for the involvement in the murder of Abby and Libby might be the concept of blood in, blood out, which means, quote, social acceptance into their secret circles. All of this information was relayed to Liggett and the Unified Command team, yet Unified Command provided zero guidance as what to do to capitalize on this information in order to work towards solving the murders. Additionally, Unified Command learned that Johnny Messer's ex-girlfriend had been listening to and recording Johnny Messer's phone calls. Police secured the phone and listened to three phone calls involving Johnny Messer. In two of those phone calls, Messer was, quote, offering money to other people to find someone so they can be injured or killed, end quote. The third call involves Messer, quote, bragging about holding a subject hostage and shooting them at his house. Uh, <clears throat> essentially, Unified Command said, quote, nothing to see here, move along, nothing to see here regarding Johnny Messer and issued no search warrants for his home, none that have been disclosed, uh, disclosed to the defense, nor did they attempt to utilize an age-old investigative tool referred to as an interrogation to pursue the truth about the involvement of Johnny Messer, Brad Holder, or Patrick Westfall in these crimes. Many more shocking facts concerning, uh, concerning this so-called investigation will be, uh, be revealed in the body of the memorandum. All right, and, and kind of the last thing I wanna get into, because Jay, like if you're not aware, um, when I was at that hearing and, and I can't remember if I just said it on here that it, it broke like the stunning news that 
Richard Allen had called his wife on recorded. Did I say that already? So he, you he haven't called said that today, but yeah, I mean, okay, talked- so okay, so like at the hearing, uh, McLeland or McClellan, the the prosecutor says, okay, well, you know, whatever else might be going on, we now have recordings of Richard Allen calling his wife and confessing to killing the girls. So like when you're online now and you're seeing the pushback of, oh, well, Alan confessed, he confessed to it. You know, in the meantime, his lawyers are saying he's nuts. I didn't know what to believe at that point because based on the testimony from the jailers from Westville at that hearing, you know, it seemed like they over blew the conditions of what he was staying in. The lawyers had said that he was sleeping on, you know, like on the ground, that he wasn't eating, they were starving him out blah, blah, like all this stuff. I walked away from that hearing thinking, well, I think the defense probably over blew his conditions. You know, he's been in solitary for the entire time that he's been at Westville all by himself, 23 hours a day, going fucking nuts in a cell. And if you don't think that that happens to people, I suggest that you spend two weeks, 23 hours a day in a cell with no windows and see where you end up mentally before you start like talking about how no one's going nuts in those conditions till you walk a mile in somebody else's shoes that have been in those conditions. Keep your thoughts to yourself on that. Seriously. Um, this is where it blows my mind, Jay. So in this, uh, this other shit, what so page this are you on, Bob? Uh, I'm on 19. See, I've been reading this again. I just, I just keep reading it cause I can't stop reading it, but this is where it gets crazy. And this goes directly to his confessions. All right. The evidence shows that during his pretrial incarceration at Westville Correctional Facility, Richard Allen has been monitored, intimidated, and mentally abused by correctional officers who are also members of the Odinite cult. Two of those correctional officers, and they name names. This isn't like they're these, they are naming names, man. It, it, so two of these correctional officers are named Sergeant Robinson and Sergeant Jones. These Westville correction officers boldly wore patches on their Department of Corrections, DOC uniforms that proclaimed, quote, in Odin, we trust. So I want you to I want you to try to like picture guards in a prison, in a state prison that have patches like the members of the New York Knights put on their their patch of of wonder boy the lightning bolt except they're putting it on their prison their prison their state issued prison uniforms where it says in odin we trust along with another patch displaying symbols which i'm sure are exactly what you just had up of odinism interlocking triangles both odinite correctional officers sergeant robinson and sergeant jones also displayed images of runes and or other odinite symbols on their facebook pages As recently as June 25, 2023, for example, Odinite Sergeant Robinson openly displayed a photograph of his Odinite altar on his Facebook page. A similar altar can be found on the Facebook page of Brad Holder. Beginning at least on April 3rd of 2023, Sergeant Jones and Sergeant Robinson wore their Odin patches when the defense team visited Richard Allen. However, Sergeant Robinson and Sergeant Jones' brazen display of their Odinite patches came to an end on August 17th, 2023. What changed? Why suddenly did they no longer display their Odinite patches beginning on August 17th, 2023? The visit between Richard Allen and his defense team. Here is your possible answer. It was not until August 10th the deposition of none other than Trooper Jerry Holman that Richard Allen's defense team finally revealed to the prosecutor and to the unified command that for many months, they, Richard Allen defense teams, Rosie and Baldwin, had been fully aware of the strong evidence linking Odinism to the murders. It was also at this August 10th deposition that the unified command learned that Richard Allen's defense team was not only aware of this information, but also intended to expose the linkage of Abby and Libby's murders to Odinism and would also be revealing the names of the Odinists at trial. At that deposition, Holman and the prosecutor also learned that the defense team 
obviously intended on exposing the Unified Command's utter failure in pursuing the Odinist suspects, in spite of the powerful evidence of Odin Knight's involvement in the murders. However, and this is important to note, at his August 10th deposition, Richard uh, Richard's defense did not let Holdman or anyone else know that it, the defense team, was fully aware of the Odin Knight correction officers at Westville wearing in Odin We Trust patches. Okay, so they didn't let them know at that depth. Richard Allen's defense team's next visit with Richard Allen at Westville following August 10th, 2023, DEP, occurred one week later on August 17th, 2023. Curiously, or perhaps not so curiously, in those seven days since the defense team revealed their knowledge that evidence linked Odinus to the murders, for the first time, Sergeant Robinson was no longer wearing the Odin patch. It was almost as if Someone had alerted Odinite Robinson that the gig was up because the lawyers knew about the links to Odinism. So lose the patch and pray that the defense attorneys had never noticed the patches on prior visits. Unfortunately for Westville and Unified Command, Rick's defense team absolutely noticed the Odinite patches worn by Sergeant Robinson and Sergeant, Sergeant Jones beginning April 3rd, 2023. Furthermore, Rick's defense team absolutely noticed the conspicuous absence of Sergeant Robinson's Odin patches following Trooper Holman's realization that Rick's defense team was fully aware of the connection between the murders and Odinism, as well as the failure of the Unified Command to follow through on the evidence that linked the murders to Odinism. Oh, man. All right. So, and this is going to be the last thing I'm going to read in this, in this section, okay? Because it's just like, this goes directly to the confession. The court will learn in the body of this memorandum. Remember, this is just the briefing to the judge. So the judge doesn't have to read 136 pages. They want him to get the flavor or her. They want her to get the flavor of what the hell they're talking about. So they're going through this. And then there's a, a 110 pages of evidence. Okay. Like of receipts. The court will learn in the body of this memorandum that Sergeant Jones and Sergeant Robinson, who are the men who were watching Richard Allen, were seemingly always by Richard Allen's side during most, if not every visit. Normally, correction officers, usually Sergeant Robinson and or Sergeant Jones, were within earshot of every conversation between Richard and his attorneys uh, and between Richard and his wife. Close enough that Richard would have to be worried about any conversation with his attorneys and with his wife being overheard by Sergeant Robinson and Sergeant Jones or other corrections officers. Beginning on April 3rd, 2023, for several visits thereafter, and I heard this testimony at, at that hearing, okay? And I was like, I, I, it, blew, it, was the, it was the thing that disturbed me most as a defense attorney where I'm going in. And I am supposed to be able to have privileged conversations with my client to prepare for trial that no one should be privy to, let alone cops or correction officers or the prosecution, any of them. That's the whole point. You have to have it. So it's privileged, which means no one can hear it. So while they're there trying to do that with Richard Allen, uh, Westville correction officers even videotaped attorney visits between Richard and his defense team. Most of the time, if not every time, it was Sergeant Jones or Sergeant Robinson bringing the handheld camcorder to the visit. Correction officers even required that Richard Allen be positioned <coughs> facing the window where the corrections officer was videotaping the attorney visit with the handheld camcorder. This positioning of Richard Allen's body would allow the correction officers to videotape Richard Allen's mouth as he talked to his attorneys. Richard would therefore underline not be able to privately discuss anything with his attorneys, such as, quote, the guards are telling me that my wife and my family will be killed unless I call my wife and tell her that I killed those girls, end quote. Instead, a mentally defeated Richard Allen would continually mutter to his defense team at every visit these types of general questions quote is my wife alive is my family alive is my wife safe 
Is my family safe? End quote. At one such meeting with his attorneys, Richard Allen mumbled in a somewhat incoherent fashion that Odinites were threatening him. It would be important to know that Richard Allen's defense team had never mentioned the word Odinites or Odinism or informed Richard Allen that evidence suggests that Odinists murdered Abby and Libby until August 25th of 2023. So these are visits that take place before months before they ever mention anything about the Odinites to Richard Allen. And they'll tell you why it's significant. Um, when his defense team, in the presence of his wife, who was visiting Rick in the prison, first discovered the exculpatory Odin-related evidence to Rick. Rick's defense team felt that having him remain unaware would hopefully keep Rick a bit safer. Due to Rick's weakened mental state and the concern that he might unwittingly discuss his attorney's strategy to Sergeant Jones and Sergeant Robinson, Rick's attorneys opted to not discuss Odinism with their client out of fear that Sergeant Robinson and Sergeant Jones would then be on the alert that Richard's defense team was aware of the Odinite involvement. Richard's defense team needed additional time to investigate and review of evidence before feeling confident and comfortable in revealing their knowledge to the court of the strong evidence that Odinite murdered the girls and that the Unified Command had chosen to do nothing about it, but in fact had hidden these facts from Judge Diener. Therefore, Richard's team opted to keep Richard in the dark about the Odinite connection to the murders supported by the evidence. And then there's a whole footnote about how hard that was for his defense team to keep that from him. So, I mean, it goes on and on and on and on. And they continue, they go and, and they attack the affidavit itself. They talk about uh, Liggett's timeline and their need to place Allen on the, uh, on the high bridge at 2 13 PM and that he needed. So if you remember, if any of you out there have read the affidavits, Liggett desperately needed Betsy Blair, who was one of the witnesses that went unnamed because we got it redacted when we got the affidavit <clears throat> needed Betsy Blair to describe a man on the bridge that looked like Richard Allen. And furthermore, desperately needed Betsy Blair to describe a car that she observed parked at the CPS parking lot at approximately 2.15, as looking like Richard Allen's black Ford Focus. Suffice it to say, the evidence will show that Liggett concealed from Judge Diener that Betsy Blair described a man on the bridge that looked nothing like Richard Allen and described a car at the CPS that looked nothing like Richard Allen's car, both in color and design. The evidence will show that Betsy provided these timeline defeating descriptions directly to Liggett face to face, not once, but two times in 2019. Yet Liggett failed to inform Judge Diener of these descriptions as well as informed Diener of the fatal flaws that these missing descriptions created for the timeline. The evidence will also show that Liggett just flat out lied about what he claimed Sarah Carbaugh told him in 2017 concerning a man walking down the road near the murder scene. For Liggett's timeline to work, Liggett needed Sarah Carbaugh to describe a man walking down the road wearing a blue jacket who had blood covering his clothing. However, in 2017, Sarah did not say these things. This did not prevent Liggett from affirming under oath that Sarah Carbaugh did say those things. In fact, what Sarah Carbaugh actually told Liggett in 2017, that she, Carbaugh, observed a man walking down the road, down the road wearing a tan coat whose clothes were muddy. Nowhere did Carbaugh claim in 2017 that the man she observed was wearing a blue cloak. Nowhere did Carbaugh claim in 2017 that the man uh, she observed was wearing bloody clothes. Nowhere. This truth about what Carbaugh actually told Liggett in 2017 blows up Liggett's timeline, which is likely, which is the likely reason Liggett failed to include this information in his affidavit. Additional evidence will be presented in the body of the memorandum. So this is the final thing I'm going to read. I know I keep saying that and I keep lying, <clears throat> but this, this is it. So this, this is 
Rozzy's response to everyone out there that says, well, well, he, you know, I mean, he confessed to his wife on record. This is what his response is. To conclude the introductory portion of this memorandum, the defense would tell the court that the evidence supporting the assertions contained throughout this memorandum was buried deep in a mountain of evidence, a mountain of discovery, thousands upon thousands of pages of paperwork and hundreds of hours of video, but not buried deep enough. The court will know at the conclusion of this memorandum that the defense is not underline and bold, inventing, fabricating, or exaggerating these facts, no matter how crazy those facts may appear. Richard Allen's defense team is attaching to this memorandum the supporting documentation that provides proof that these facts are true. That's mic drop shit. It's the craziest thing I've ever read. Like, and, and, and there's a hundred more pages of it. I've never read anything like it, man. I've never read anything like Dude, it. Dude, I... I feel I, like the the air <clears throat> is taken out of me. Like it's like, and I feel emotional because like for the families, for Richard oh, Allen's man. family, like I like I want to cry because like what the fuck? And the, by the way, folks, first of all, Bob, you know, thank you so much for coming on and dropping this. But like for people that shit on defense attorneys, like this is why, folks, this is why you you could think. Before everything comes out, and when there's just like this PCA that's not so great, you know, fuck these guys. Like, this is why you need people like Bob Mata and Rozzy, because this is what happens. And to think this shit is going on, and and they're holding it, and shit is being made up, and this guy's in jail right now, and they have people who very clearly are much more likely to have done this than Richard Allen. I mean. Just going through that guy's Facebook? Like, what the fuck? Like, it's blowing my Dude, I, mind. It's blowing my mind. You talk about this all the time, Bob. Like, this is why. Because if you don't have if you don't have these rules and you don't have these motions and you don't have defense attorneys, guys in 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 prisons are gonna have fucking patches on that tie them to a group of people who probably did this, but they're trying to put someone up else up to it like i i, I don't even know i don't even know what to say insane. it's insane no i'm not a hoosier i saw julie fisher i'm a chicago guy i'm two hours away from delphi it's right over the border um yeah nick and the captain did cover this but you know what they didn't cover odin's odinism no one covered this no no one it's always been keegan klein and all the other bullshit like this this is all like mind-blowing brand new shit like no, like no one has brought this up. Like no one on Reddit. It's it's incredible. Like I like this is like beyond. Like if I were writing a fictional novel, like it's this. Like this is the shit that I'm writing. And the you editor know, would be like, "It's too over the top. You can't. Dude, this is bullshit. It's, it's too like, crazy." And, and, and they realize it sounds insane. It's like like I said. Like I love Brett of the prosecutors. I like he's a fucking brilliant guy, and I like we we completely get along on everything we may disagree on shit but we can always like talk our way through it like when i hit him up with this like and i'm like dude have you read the shit like and he dismissed it like he couldn't have read that memo he's too smart to have read that it's one thing to come in with some bald assertions another thing to come in with receipts that's it like there is no uh, there is no explanation whatsoever that is in any way shape or form going to be able to justify them failing to investigate this at all none none you know and the state is going to come back with some kind of response because they have to mcclellan can't sit there and just get this shit dumped on he's gonna have to say something somebody's gonna have to answer for something tony liggett has got issues that guy is going to be answering questions because there is just way too much here for this i mean these questions that were like regarding the the crime scene itself with all this like these runes and like they decide to ignore them like say like they're, like they're gonna they're the only response they could possibly say is that they they thought that they left those there 
in order to throw them off the track of who the real killer was. That they, they, you know, they put these runes here trying to get us to think. But who the fuck ever heard of Odinites? Not you know, I mean, the more the more likely thing is okay. Well, they had a bunch of sticks on them. We didn't think a goddamn thing of it. You know, I just thought they had sticks on them that somebody like they were trying to hide the bodies or something. They put a bunch of stuff. I, we didn't know. We didn't know until you did know. Until these three other cops did the digging, did the research, got you names, and you chose to ignore it. That's what happened here. Period. And, and by the know, way, Bob, for them yeah. to just leave that shit out there. Like they were confident that th that they weren't gonna have to worry about it. They left all that shit out there. They didn't try to hide anything because they knew they were untouchable. Which until this point, they've been untouchable, right, Bob? I mean, isn't that kind of ballsy to just leave all that shit out there afterwards? Like they had no concern that anyone was gonna come for them because they knew they were covered. They were they were all cleared. They knew they were cleared. You know what I'm saying? Like when they're posting this shit. They're given the dates of when these guys were cleared, holders cleared, messers cleared. I mean, they've got the sister of a kid that's claiming he was there. And theoretically, his DNA from his spit is on one of the girls. Dude, it's like the whole, the whole thing is insane, man. I'm just, I'm telling you, I've, like Anthony Garcia was an insane case. This just took like a, a right hand turn into fucking crazy world. Like I've never, I've never seen it. It's, it's like, you can't, this blows anything away. Like I, I've never seen anything like it. And, and, and trust me, I know cops lie. I know, like I uncovered that the fucking cops planted Gacy, you know, the receipt and Gacy, I, I know they do it, but this is like a next level amount of shit where they're knowingly putting a guy in that for all intents and purposes appears to be innocent. And they've got these guards that are Odinites that are saying that they're going to fucking kill his wife and his kid. If he doesn't call on a recorded line, making a confession. I mean, does that seem to fit? Does that seem like a plausible explanation as to why Richard Allen may have confessed to his wife? Does it answer why he's asking, is my wife safe? Is my family safe? Or is my wife alive? I mean, I mean, does I, it answer why when he walked into the court when you were there, he looked like he was looking a thousand yards ahead because he doesn't because he's being tortured? I mean, it answers all that. Uh, I'm, before Bob says anything else, guys, please, please, for Bob to come on here and drop this shit for all of us. I'm going to put the links in here. Go on his Twitter Go on Defense Diaries, uh, the podcast, follow the YouTube, five stars, let them know on Twitter. Like, this is amazing what Bob just dropped on here, that he could have gone on anywhere, and he, he called me. Yeah, we do love Bob. I love Bob. He came on to give us all this information, so please show the love, because he fucking deserves it. And follow on YouTube. I just put it up there. Follow on YouTube. Uh, yeah, Bob. We got we got some exciting exciting news coming up. I was just gonna say, but yeah, put his put put his emoji in there. And I was telling the folks this morning, you know, we had that Zoom call like more than an hour, me, Bob, and Steve, and just it's gonna be good. Just 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 be on the lookout, folks. That's all I'm gonna say. We're we're excited. We're excited about it. We are very very excited about it. Um, so all right, dude. I I guess like well, let me. Have you seen any questions? I know somebody asked about Keegan Klein. I think someone asked but, about the gun. I saw people asking about the gun. Oh, so we're talking about the the shell that they claim that yes. they found the, yes. the unspent casing that was found near the girls' bodies, and now they're claiming which uh, they claim that they found a, a a gun of the same caliber, and that they had. Uh, which, which, if you read the PCA very carefully, uh, they talk about they had a ballistics or a uh, tool marking expert test that, and that they believe that it's consistent with with Richard Allen's gun. I, I'm just going to tell you right now, ballistics and tool marking is fucking junk science. It is like no one is going to prison. No one is getting the death penalty based on ballistics or bite mark analysis or any of the old timey bullshit it, it's done like so that's what i think of the bullet i think the bullet's bullshit i think that all of you get on the twitter everyone on the stream do yourself a favor don't trust me go ahead and read that entire thing you owe it to yourself 
anybody that I see that has not read that and I see on Twitter that's talking shit, you're getting rejected. Like I'm, I'm giving you a hand to the face. And if you're not going to read the 130 pages and figure out what they're coming receipt wise, then you, you can't say anything. You, you've got nothing to say because you've got no substance. All I know is they're coming with receipts and there's some motherfuckers that are out there that are going to have to answer a lot of questions. And, you know, hey, and y'all, I'm going to be on Vinnie Politan tonight. I'm oh, shit. Bob, Vinnie Politan. Talking Prime about this Prime, case. Baby. And I won't get to swear. You're like, you see all like, that's the thing. When you're hanging with us, with the family, you get you get laid, laid back. Relax, Bob. You, you get, get laid, Bob. too. Hey, hey, hey. What are you hey. talking about? On, what are you doing? On, are you talking about this case? Yeah. On Vinnie or? Nice. Of course. Of course. Dude, so, that's gonna be um, awesome. Uh, what I want to, uh, oh. yeah, uh, yeah, so, I definitely, I, I have the entire link to my Dropbox, you all. I gave you a link to my Dropbox so you can read the entire document on your own. <clears throat> read it, he, digest it. Bob, people were asking, in. uh, like, what realistically? I know you said the state has a chance to respond. When do you think uh, there's going to be a hearing? Like, how far out? So typically. I know there is a date of October 16th. Uh, I will be there. I will um, know more at that time. Now, typically in a filing, when we file a motion to suppress or a motion for a Frank's hearing, the state is going to go in and tell the judge, okay, well, these are explosive allegations, Your Honor. We're going to have to do some serious, serious investigation into this. We're going to need time. I would not be, so typically you get 30 days. I would not be surprised if the judge gives them 60 days to file a response of pleading. I would anticipate that we'll have this hearing November or December. In the interim, uh, Rosie also filed a motion to get his fucking client out of that goddamn facility in Stanter. So that's going to get heard. So, you know, I mean, it's tough because they've already tried. They took a bite at that apple once already. That's that's what that hearing that the last hearing that I was at turned out to be was they were trying to get him moved to a different facility uh, and the judge denied the motion. So they're going to take a second bite here and um, we'll see what happens, man. So if if I had to give a a, a guesstimate, yeah, I'd say it'll probably it, it's going to take a minute, man. Like as explosive as this is, and Lexi, I don't know. I, I, there should be, there certainly should be. Like like I'm wondering, have they tested any DNA that they may have found on the girls? Problem is, from what I've heard from insiders that like you know drop little little crumbs in my ear when I'm sleeping that the girls were found in the water. So it's theoretically, I, I have heard that they recovered no DNA from the scene, you know, and I know that the girls were uh, like in the water. I believe they may have been like, I, I've heard both. I've heard that they were right on the shore and I've heard that they were in the water. If they're in the water in terms of there being DNA from this kid spitting on them, you know, it, it's, it's a lot, man. It's a lot to die. I, and I haven't even read all of it yet. Like I like, my mind is just like, I just, I've never, like in a case this size that had fallen to the wayside in terms of like public exposure and media exposure, because we have Lisk going, we've got Hewerman, we've got Idaho 4, we've got all these insane cases just like continually dropping one after another. This case is about to like blow the wheels off of everything right now and drive right to the front of the pack because this this shit that we just went through i've never seen anything like it man and they're and they're not coming with bullshit they're, they're like i mean you've got cops giving affidavits talk about a thin blue line being obliterated you got cops saying i went to these dudes i went to them i told them and they ignored me I, you know you multiple cops not just one cop you got cops so we'll see how it shakes out i it's like you said, Jay, I feel awful for Richard Allen's wife, his kid. I feel awful for Abby and Libby's families that are being sold a fucking like complete and total lie, it sounds like. And look, I've got to, like Allison told me to reel it in. Like she's like, 
The state's going to respond. The state's going to respond. Maybe they have viable excuses for all this. So I'm going to give the state the ability to respond before I completely lose my fucking mind. But I'm telling you right now, based on what they're providing, and this has nothing to do with me being a defense attorney. This has to do with me being a human being who's smart enough to read some shit and use common sense and know that something is awry here. Something is up. There's, you know, there, there's something that is is foul about everything that's going on with this case. The fact that this guy's statement, Richard Allen's statement, was buried for five years should have sent a fucking red flag up to everyone involved with this case. Uh, how does a statement like that get buried for five years? And then he gets arrested 26 days before an election when people are trying to get reelected, when they need an arrest of this size and a case of this magnitude. There's a lot there, dude. So so what time are you on the old the Vinster? Uh, eight? Isn't he that. usually eight or nine? Let Eastern? me see. Yeah. Like I was, <laughs> I was actually on with uh, Julia Janae and um, <clears throat> Ted, Ted Roland when Marina hit me. Uh, so for my, it's, it's eight to eight 45 your time. And so that's seven to seven 45 my time. Well, that works out folks, because what are we doing today at seven Eastern time for those? Uh, this, this, what? Oh, we're eight two. Oh shit. All right. Uh, sorry. We already planned this book. So have both on core TV and us, because for the folks that don't know who are new to this channel tonight, if you're familiar with Alina Burroughs. From Crime Scene Confidential on Discovery ID, Shannon and I will be interviewing her for Women Who Rock. So you got T you got on the TV, you got Court TV with Bob. On the old YouTube kick, Twitch, Facebook, you got me, Shannon, Alina Burroughs, folks, tonight. Bob, I seriously I think, I think Alina's fucking mind might be blown about this. I think maybe y'all like need to have this shit like on the background discussing it on the stream a little bit of it like you want to give all her shit because alina's a badass motherfucker i'll tell you that right now she she is a woman who rocks she's like, on the btk all, task force bob did you know that dude, all, all 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 our gals that come on here are women that rock i mean we like the amount of women that rock that hang around with us turds is like stuff. and, and oh, right. guys we're Allie's going to be our, with our rock. two wives. Like we've yeah. got two wives that just crush the world. So like, and know, Allie's coming on women who rock. We're going to book that. So just look, look forward, look for that coming up. And Chris says, I'm putting Bob on a retainer. As soon as the stream ends, he's going to keep me a free man. <laughs> hey, Chris, I got you. Hey, but Chris said he could beat my ass. Like he hasn't seen me without my shirt off. I'm big. Oh, oh, <laughs> oh, oh, oh. <laughs> Chris is like, I wouldn't want to get in a debate with him, but I could probably beat his ass. I love you, Chris. I'm fucking with you, man. Dude, like, so we got hugs in love with me anyway, man. We so. got Bob's voices today. We got Bob's dropping the two. Bob did my impression. He did impression on me first time, I think. We had the impression. We had the general public. We had the voices. We had flexing now for the first time. Bob flexing on the stream. Oh, and what do we always have? Bob dropping the fucking truth to everyone. So, Bob, thank you so much. What do you want to play? Defense Diaries podcast, uh, oh, YouTube. No, dude, and, and look. Like I, I need like anybody who is in our family here that's not listening to my podcast, like my mind is blown that like you wouldn't be listening to the podcast. So Alice and I are deep diving now, like, and we're so into Avery. So as you may or may not know, uh, convicting a murderer, the counter argument to making a murderer just dropped on Daily Wire. I had to spend a hundred and ten dollars for something I would never in a million years spend $110 on, which is a Daily Wire production, but I had to watch it. We're doing the deepest dive on the Stephen Avery case. And we're, the, it's not, oh, we think it, we're not doing that. This is, we have, I am on the fence. I do not know. I did not trust making a murder. I loved it. I thought it was fascinating. I realized the minute it ended that they, for, like they left out all kinds of shit. And, and convicting a murderer is doing the same thing. Like exactly what they're doing is they're saying, oh, well, here's what making a murderer didn't put in. So that makes him guilty. No, it doesn't. We are going through the entire police report. 
which is from from Caso, which is Calumet County, which was the the investigating agency, even though it seems to be that it was really Manitowoc County who was supposed to take a back seat because there was a thirty six million dollar lawsuit against them. We're going through all the reports. We're going through all the motion work. We're going through the trial transcripts. We're going through Zellner's shit. And then and only then Allison and I are going to tell you whether or not Stephen Avery and Brendan Dassey killed Teresa Halbach. And we're going to be boots in the ground up in Wisconsin. I am going to go try to interview every motherfucker I can up there because I'm getting to the truth on this thing. I'm not a documentary. We have no agenda. So everybody who's like, oh, I'm leaning innocent. I am not leaning innocent. I'm leaning nowhere. I am strictly on the fence right now. 100% on the fence. And our deep dives are like no other in the game. None. Like I'll put our, I will put our podcast up against any other podcast out there. My Gacy season was 36 episodes and I get it. Some people it's too much. It's a lot. Like, like when I'm saying like some people like surface level shit, they don't like that deep dive. If you want to get into the nitty gritty, if you want to learn how the system works, if you want to learn everything about a case, and I'm talking about everything where I'm not picking and choosing what you get to hear, listen to our podcast. I think it's the best podcast on the fucking planet, but of course I'm biased. So what do I know? Well, I love you, man. Dude, um, uh, by the way, I just want to say when you're on Defense Star, you get cool merch. He's got new merch. You got my <laughs> Team Alley shirt. So. Uh, look out for the merch there. And also, Bob, just real quick, Bob's going to be at CrimeCon. And you know how Conan used to have Triumph, the insult comic dog, going to – I'm going to have Bob. He's going to have a little dog on his hand, and he's going to go for me to poop. He's going to do the whole thing. So we're going to have live coverage from – Man on the Street interviews this weekend right on the stream. Don't oh. miss it. Like, dude, I'm going to be I'm gonna be finding all the homies. I'm going to be finding Mac. I'm going to be finding Jessica Knoll, all the Todd, bosses, Joe Jackalone, Joey's there, all the people, all the people. If you guys tell Jay while you're on the stream, because I won't be able to read because I'll be walking around like live streaming this shit to y'all. If you guys are like, hey, go find whoever, whoever, I'm on it. Jay will, Jay will be like, he'll be like, yo, go find whoever, whoever. I'll go talk to him for y'all. And you also, he's to go to True Crime Garage, folks. Go to Nick and the Captain. I'll go say what's up. Whoever y'all want, it's going to be dope. And for later great. for uh, later streams or other streams, he's also going to do it on Publicly Buzzed. So if for folks who are 100%. not, make sure you're subscribed to Publicly Buzzed because he'll be doing it there too. Bob, thank you so freaking much. Uh, I love you, man. We, we, I love you, dude. So uh, where's... And I love all you guys out there. You guys are the best. We, we like privately, we talk about you guys. You guys, the- just so you know, like everything that we're saying about you guys, and I'm talking about every one of you that is here day in, day out, that supports the hell out of all of us, that we love you so much. Those conversations are 100% from directly from our hearts and 100% true. And like, like if you could be a fly on the wall when, when it's me, Steve, Dan, Jay, Shannon, Allison, when we're talking about you, we love you. Like I, I cannot, I cannot impress upon you enough how much we adore you, how much you guys mean to us. You're our everything. That's the fucking so truth, we man. We love you guys, man. All, All right, right, dude. Deuces, I'm YOLO. Up. Fuck you, Ted.